So ladies and gentlemen, we are coming to the last panel. After that, as uh, is stated in the program, we will have a short musical interludium, and after that, we have a reception. Uh, you may become hungry, or you may be hungry, so there will be even some warm food, don't worry. And of course, something to drink. So, we are at the panel Civil Society, and uh, there has been a lot of references to the civil society already, in that uh, civil society was not only a watchdog, but it was a driver of reforms. Uh, and Ukraine is where it is, forget about the war, where it was immediately before the war, uh, because uh, on one hand, due to the pressure from the international community, especially European Union, World Bank, etc., IMF, but on the other hand, and I would say to the, to the same extent, because of the hard work and continuous pressure from the civil society. So, civil society is not only a watchdog, civil society is also a driver of the development of Ukraine. We are a little bit late, so I would leave it at that. Let me just introduce to you our panel. First, and we will start with her, we have Alexandra Matvichuk. She is the chairwoman of Center for Civil Liberties. Unfortunately, she will be only online because she has been traveling for nearly half a year to and through, so she could not make it, but uh, she has agreed, and I'm happy about that, to make an online statement. Unfortunately, she is not here physically, like she was, I think, six weeks ago in Vienna, in the Jewish Museum, but uh, happy to have you. Second, we have Jana Barinova. Jana Barinova, she is here physically at the panel, She's project manager, European policies and Ukraine at the Erste Foundation, Erste Stiftung. But not only that, she has left Ukraine due to the war, and before that, she was heading the cultural department of the city of Kiev under Mayor Vitaly Klitschko. And before that, she has been general secretary or head of Babin Yar, and uh, this is the site where uh, the Nazis uh, were killing some 25, 30,000. 33. 33,000 33, uh, Ukrainian, Ukrainian Jews within 24 or 36 hours. This was a killing. Okay, then we have on my left Irina Komiak. She's program officer of the German Marshall Fund. And uh, as you should know, and as you will know, the German Marshall Fund is one of the drivers of the restructuring of the recovery of the building up of Ukraine uh, with uh, uh, an initiative uh, to have a new fund, Marshall Fund, for the build up of Ukraine. Last, last not least, online, we have Alexander Sushko. He is executive director of International Renaissance Foundation. International Renaissance Foundation has been active in Kiev for, a th for I think, some 15 years or so. And uh, they have donated uh, more than 200 or maybe 300 million dollars for Ukraine. Who has done that? This was a certain Mr. Soros. So, it's a Soros uh, foundation, as is Open Society, and in Ukraine, it's an international uh, Renaissance foundation. Last not least, to my right, it's Palac, right? Or I'm not so good. Trenceni. He's professor of the whole historical department of the Central European University. He is at the Democracy Institute. He is elected director of Academia Europea. 
He has several fellowships. He's a uh, fellow in, in several organizations. And uh, he will talk about the Invisible University for Ukraine project. Uh, and uh, uh, last one, far left, is a colleague of mine, because I'm also board director of the, N of the Ukrainian NGO, Vilna Nazia, Free Nation. And it was Bogdan uh, who had invited me to join. And I'm kind of an international ambassador, international relations, etc., of this Vilna Nazia uh, NGO. So let me start the whole thing, the whole panel, with Alexandra. And may I ask her for five to ten minutes uh, an initial statement? Uh, what do you see and how do you see the civil society now, say even up to now, and what is the role of civil society from now on and especially after the war? Thank you very much for having you with us. Thank you very much for providing me a floor. It's a huge honor for me to have opportunity to address to this distinguished audience. Uh, when we speak about the role of civil society, first of all, I must admit that Ukrainian civil society has grown up after large-scale invasion. In past years, sociology indicated only 8% of people who undertook something for public well-beings, according to the uh, Democracy Initiative um, research. Now, hardly anyone can stay indifferent. Ordinary people in Ukraine do extraordinary things and risk their own lives for the sake of others. And when we speak about role of civil society, people play different role in different field uh, in order to fulfill two tasks. The first task is to defend our country, our people and our democratic choice. Uh, unlike international organizations, which since the beginning of the full-scale invasion evacuated their personnel abroad or to more secure oblasts, Ukrainian civil society has been working locally all this time. Ordinary people rescue wounded from under the rubbles of the destroyed houses, evacuated others under Russian shellings, find way to encircle cities to, uh, in order to deliver humanitarian aid, support each other and help to survive in bomb shelters, provide medical care without electricity, heat, water or light. Authoritarian regime perceived the world through the specific prism. Putin thought that exclusively Ukrainian armed forces would resist him. He misjudged. Few, uh, entire Ukrainian people resist him. But what is interesting that democratic West also failed to understand this. Unlike the developed democracies, Ukrainians have never enjoyed the opulence of effective state institutions. This is the reason why, since the full-scale invasion, the point of crystallization started appeared not only in state uh, bodies, but on their own in different sectors of civil society. And suddenly it appeared that people are more significant than the army number two in the world, that ordinary people's efforts have practical impact and determine the outcome of this war. But we have also the second task because victory for Ukraine is not just to repeal Russian troops out from Ukrainian territory and release people who live in Crimea and other temporary occupied regions of Ukraine. Victory for Ukraine is means to succeed in democratic transition of our country. Nine years ago, in the course of a revolution of dignity, we were fighting for our own democratic choice just for a chance to develop our country where everyone's rights would be protected, the government would be accountable, the court would be independent, and the police wouldn't disperse any peaceful students' demonstrations. And we paid the high price for that. When Yanukovych regimes collapsed, Ukraine got a chance for democratic transformation. And in order to stop us on this way, 
back in 2014, Putin unleashed this war of aggression and occupied Crimea and certain areas of Donetsk and Lugansk Oblast. And last year, he expanded this war to the large-scale invasion. Because Putin is not afraid of NATO, he is afraid of the idea of freedom. And this war is a war about senses. This is not just the war between two states. This is a war between two systems, authoritarianism and democracy. Ukraine's success will have great impact on the democratic future of Russia itself and the entire region, where in some states freedom is restricted to the size of the prison cell. So we have a very hard task to continue our Yemen integration path and uh, provide democratic cardinal reforms. Uh, you know that it's very difficult to make uh, cardinal reforms even during the peaceful time, and it's become extremely difficult uh, during the large-scale invasion. But we have no other chance. We have no other time. And that is why we have no luxury to concentrate it only to resistance. We have to show a positive result on the way of Yevra integration, which was underlined by Revolution of Dignity. And to conclude uh, my uh, remarks, I want to say that the, I would not wish anyone to go through our experience because war is something horrible. But all these challenges provide us opportunity to reveal the best in us, to be courageous, to fight for freedom, to make a difficult but right choices and to help each other. And that is why I am looking in future with optimism. I don't see the future easy, it will be difficult, but I know that ordinary people have much greater impact than they think. And in this war, you, each Ukrainians know that we are fighting for freedom in all senses for a freedom to be independent country, not Russian colony, for a freedom to preserve Ukrainian identity and not to be forced to educate Ukrainian children as Russians, and for a freedom to have our democratic choice, which means to build our country where the rights of every people will be protected. Thank you. Alexandra, your organization, the organization you are chairing, uh, Center for Civil Liberties, has been awarded the Peace Nobel Prize. And this is uh, something uh, I can only say bravo. <laughs> what are the plans? Say, uh, let's suppose and let's hope that the war will be over sooner rather than later. What are the plans of uh, Center of Civil Liberties uh, to, to, to contribute to the build-up of Ukraine from the angle of the civil society? We also found our responsibility in these two tasks, tasks which I mentioned before. Uh, we document uh, Russian war crimes in order that sooner or later all Russians who committed these crimes by their own hands, as well as Putin and uh, high political leadership and top military command will be brought to justice. Because justice is not just precondition to the sustainable peace in our region where Russia for decades uses the war as a tool how to achieve their geopolitical interests and uses the war crimes and the methods how to win this war. Russia is also a precondition, uh, sorry, justice is also a precondition to the speed of democratic reform. And now I switch to the second task, which we as a Center for Civil Liberties see our responsibility to contribute in democratic transitions of Ukraine. And we'll explain this link. Because when we speak about democratic transitions, it's not enough just to adopt equalities, laws, and build formal institutions. The values of society always prevail. And 
I work directly with people, and I know that people affected by this war, they need to restore not just their broken lives, broken visions of the future, but also their broken belief that rule of law is essential and justice is possible even though delayed in time. And that is why we must demonstrate justice. Without this energy, uh, that without this belief, it will be very difficult to make this new laws and uh, formal institutions to work in a proper direction. Thank you very much. So we all wish you, uh, will you be able to stay with us for some time or are sure. you in a hurry? Perfect. So if there are questions, uh, they may be directed to you a little bit later on as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, talking about Russian war crimes, I, must, uh, I may just tell you and the audience that there is a project, uh, even in Austria, in Vienna, uh, by the Presidential Office of Ukraine uh, to show the exhibition Russian war crimes in Ukraine uh, at the University of Vienna. I, I have the privilege to have initiated uh, such a uh, uh, project in Austria, but uh, the Presidential Office had to decide to prioritize uh, this exhibition uh, to go to New York because uh, they are fighting for every vote at the General Assembly of the United Nations concerning the special tribunal. So I'm quite much involved and I do hope that uh, this exhibition, which was planned and we had an opening uh, with the Austrian Minister of Justice, etc., etc., everything was fixed, but due to these understandable developments and circumstances. Uh, this was uh, going to New York rather than to Vienna. Thank you very much. So, I may continue uh, talking a little bit about culture, talking about the cultural uh, past of Jana in Kiev, and talking about cultural projects, and I know that even at Erste Stiftung uh, you're doing some, some cultural projects. Uh, what is your view of uh, uh, civil society's role from now on and in the future? And what do you think uh, you in your actual position could also contribute to that? Thank you, Thank you very much. Do you hear me well in this? Yeah, okay, thank you. So, um, definitely uh, civil society is the skeptic partner and the challenger for government, uh, but I have a firm belief that uh, government, business, and so-called third sector should work in a tandem. And I partly disagree even with this concept of third sector, maybe it's first sector, because when we I look closer to the formulation of government servant. It means you serve communities. There's služba, ty služiš. So uh, when you serve, it means that third sector and civil society can't be number three. So this is my small uh, reflections uh, while I was thinking about uh, um, uh, about this um, about this panel. Um, so civil society needs young people. Uh, activists, we need to uh, foster their inspiration, we need to encourage them, uh, we need to incubate new initiatives, uh, new institutions, and uh, civil society's fundamental building block for any democracy, for any uh, developing uh, and uh, uh, successful country, and also uh, it's uh, important part of reconciliation uh, process. So uh, working uh, today at the Erste Foundation, it's European foundation that contribute a lot to the social, economic, and cultural uh, innovations across Europe. Uh, we, uh, starting from this year, faced many, let's say, existential questions. How to help Ukraine? What to do? Uh, and not only Erste Foundation. I observed this uh, also talking with colleagues from uh, other European uh, foundations. First year, it was year of direct aid, urgent needs, uh, direct aid on the borders, but now we see that uh, 
I hope the war will uh, end rather sooner than later, but still it continues. So uh, what the strategy of European philanthropy should be, what, uh, what we can undertake. And uh, I think that uh, the main uh, thing it's not to do for Ukraine, but to do with Ukraine, because definitely we don't want to be passive recipient of, uh, of, of funds. We want to be co-creator of uh, important, impactful uh, programs. So I identify uh, capacity building initiatives as the top priority uh, for the next several years. Why? Because we say restart Ukraine, rebuild Ukraine, renew Ukraine, uh, European integration, but this is just words. Behind each of these words there are people uh, and their capacities and their knowledge and their expertise, what they can and what they can't. So I think the best thing what we can do to prepare people for such enormous undertaking uh, as rebuild uh, Ukraine to equip with knowledge, to equip with networks, uh, to, to equip with uh, um, best practices. And this, in a way, mean decolonization of European philanthropy. Uh, what I mean? Uh, it means that you help in order to live at certain point. You help to grow uh, Ukrainian third sector. You help uh, Ukrainian NGOs to strengthen its own capacity because Many big international foundations, missions come to Ukraine, and what happens? They had hunt best minds. Of course, uh, many people choose working for international organizations. It's prestigious, it's, it's security, it's good salary. And then when mission of this organization finished and this organization leave uh, the Ukraine, it's again tabula rasa, because there is no internal infrastructure that can continue to work. So uh, I would call uh, all those partners who are open and keen to, to help Ukraine, to, um, to do with Ukraine, and to help to strengthen its own capacity, and for each project to find implementing partner in Ukraine. It's absolutely another tactic how you cooperate with Ukraine. From other side, it's a big homework for Ukrainian NGOs because you should be transparent, you should be accountable, um, uh, and you should know how to accompany uh, international organization in their mission in Ukraine. Because to receive the grant, it's one thing, but to report on this grant, to measure deliverables, and then to build long-term sustainable strategy, it's also different type of skill that require strategic planning, uh, visioning, uh, compliance with lots of international programs, documents, strategies uh, and agendas. So I think uh, that um, each stakeholder, let's say, uh, has many things to reflect. Ukrainian government definitely can't monopolize ideas, can't monopolize decision-making process because it means uh, uh, stagnation. So uh, if all these, let's say, components would come together, uh, I do believe that ecosystem of uh, civil society uh, will, will develop uh, successfully uh, in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jana. Uh, maybe I should mention that Erste Foundation is so clearly pro-Ukraine uh, that uh, you have done uh, quite a few important projects in the past, and I do hope that you will continue that. Uh, I had a talk with uh, Andreas Dreichel exactly one year ago, or maybe beginning of July last year, and he assured me that you will continue, and this is a very valuable contribution, uh, not least to tell the real story. And the real story of the war, of the reasons of the war, and uh, uh, the consequences and uh, the future of Ukraine, this real story has to be told in order to counter the Russian narrative which is in most cases, in many cases, just fake. May I continue with my neighbor, Irina? Uh, 
as I said, you are German Marshall Fund, but in today we are not speaking about money and financial plans. Today we are speaking about uh, civil society, and uh, this is a, a topic of yours. Please. Thank you so much. Um, it's also an honor, uh, an honor to be here um, and um, to a certain extent to represent sort of the other part of what German Marshall Fund of the United States is doing um, now more in Ukraine. Uh, but um, as part of the history of German Marshall Fund, there was the part that has been working with support for civil society um, in the region of Central and Eastern Europe since 20 years, focusing on different countries. Um, following the full-scale invasion, uh, in February last year, uh, we established the, the emergency support program to support specifically Ukrainian civil society on as local levels as possible. Um, this uh, built up on the 15 years old of uh, 15 years of experience of already Black Sea Trust that has been operating in Ukraine. Um, but following the the needs of uh, of the civil society on the ground, we decided um, to emphasize uh, to emphasize and sort of reinforce the support. Um, the um, full scale invasion, um, to a certain extent, um, shifted the the paradigm of. Uh, of donor civil society relations, so to say, because at some point the donors community started responding to the needs of the civil society on the ground instead of dictating or shaping the narrative per se. Um, since the um, last, uh, late last March, beginning of April last year, we've already supported around 200 uh, projects inside of the country, as I said, on as local levels as possible, because that's where the resilience is taking place, that's where the recovery is taking place. Um, I'm not um, undermining or neglecting the role of the state level NGOs and um, and initiatives. Um, I'm just trying to focus on what I've been working with and also to sort of bring up this perspective. Um, since the last year, we've seen that um, this flexibility of local NGOs, they turned the, the tables around saying that NGOs inside of themselves, they can shift their priorities, they can be flexible, they can um, switch in between being a media into learning how to document war crimes. Um, on the as basic level as possible, but still to contribute to as much as possible. The smaller NGOs in uh, already liberated areas are building the bridges between people and local authorities for the state to sort of come back. And to exactly, we've been talking about the trust and belief earlier today, but those are the civil society and volunteers and people who I believe I think that every second Ukrainian, if not every Ukrainian, is a volunteer, um, is working towards establishing this trust in between local authorities as well and people. Uh, we've seen that small organizations started um, with different tools, um, digital, whatever, trying to establish support for internally displaced people, from meeting people at the stations to providing them with social services, to prov with providing them with psychological support, finding the linkages, how to support people on the ground. And this has been working. We've seen the shift in the society, per se, when it comes specifically to the psychological support. When we've seen since 2014, and we were talking about the issues of veterans that was in minority nowadays this is on the agenda of many local NGOs because this concerns everyone um, as well um, following the um, the London conference I've heard there was a really good phrase saying that decentralized is not disconnected this is basically what also is happening in Ukraine on the local levels this decentralization is taking place the resilience is taking place but also in a very connected way because people meet each other people talk to each other and they try to find to complement whatever everyone um, is doing and this is exactly the resilience that we are trying to support and to reinforce the uh, um, recovery itself um, and again resilience uh, have to be um, coming from ukrainian side it is coming from ukrainian side this is just to re uh, to sort of second everyone um, the opinions that has been said uh, that have been talking uh, talked before today that uh, this is uh, 
the Ukrainians who have to be empowered and they have to be in charge of their future. When it comes to narratives, we do work with also small independent media, um, and again, trying to uh, to see this in the perspective of disinformation and fake news. This is a problem not only of the West, but inside of the country as well. Um, I think we've talked um, a bit about the, the role of civil society, but per se media, um, as especially after 2013, 2014, the revolution of dignity, we've seen how the civil civic journalism has been empowered and sort of um, being developing. That's what we also see nowadays. Uh, people try to support the armed forces of Ukraine also just with their phones, just with being informed, uh, just with informing um, the authorities with every possible way they see. Um, every Ukrainian abroad uh, becomes the um, ambassador of Ukraine to a certain extent. And this is important, especially in terms of fighting disinformation and fake news that unfortunately has been present in the West, I would like to say for the last 30 years, but I know I'm mistaking to say that. Um, and this is exactly, um, the when it comes to recovery, this is a very small um, early term, mid term, long term perspective that is establishing the background for Ukrainian civil society to go on further. Inside of the country, Ukrainians know what to do, we know what we don't want, but at the same time, this is the opportunity for the West to see what's been actually happening, how it has been happening, and how the history is reshaping itself. Um, probably, I would leave more opportunities for the questions, but to say that um, it is really important to empower the locals, uh, the local um, um, organizations because they are fast, they know what they're doing, they know how they're doing things, and they're being very effective and very inspiring. Another thing just to add about youth organizations, this is a very inspirational and also personal experience for me because seeing the continuation of tradition of this resilience um, of youth um, is very inspiring and also gives as much optimism as possible to see uh, how the future is being shaped. They are politically active, they are very much uh, persistent and insistent and in extremely energetic. And this is inspiring not only for the country inside of it, but also for people outside. Thanks. Thank you, Irina. <laughs> Talking about resilience, I may tell you one minute uh, about uh, what I experienced when I was leaving Ukraine one week after the start of the war. When we were going through the Carpathians, it was near Tianopil and then Stri, where, Michaela, you have a business, uh, automotive sub-supplies. Um, we were going uh, towards uh, Mukachevo and then Ushgorod and uh, uh, where the mountains started and the hills became mountains, uh, there are some wooden churches, etc. And on our way there, uh, below these churches, the ancient churches, there were stalls with food and with beverages, but not for selling to the refugees. It was donations. And it was something I was really deeply impressed. So this is a clear sign of this uh, sticking together. And this is what uh, exactly the contrary to what Putin was uh, intending uh, to provoke. Uh, he, has, he has, at the end, he has provoked this resilience in that uh, uh, stand by, uh, by your people, yeah, protect your country, be resilient. Okay, uh, short question to you, Irina. You were uh, mentioning the media. What do you think uh, uh, could be done, should be done by a civil society uh, with the media, etc., to even uh, increase, enhance the effects which are needed and driven by civil society? Do you mean inside of the country or outside? inside of the country and outside? I think, 
Um, inside of the country, I think the process has already uh, started. Um, unfortunately, the first uh, wave was seen in 2014 with the internally displaced people from uh, eastern part of Ukraine to the central um, areas and western areas. Um, and um, secondly, after the 24th of February last year. Um, there is not much to, um, to somehow um, artificially reinforce this connection because uh, with the people moving around inside of the country, they see how this information works. They sort of debunk the myth and everything on their own. And they see how united the society is. Yes, there are differences, but this diversity and this, um, how shall I say, persistent diversity, I would put it this way, uh, is very much what keeps people together. And as long as this connection is being sustained naturally, it's going to somehow build up this critical approach to perceiving the information and in, in general in the media uh, sphere um, inside of the country and also outside of the country. The resilience is also coming to from the media uh, themselves, they are learning the wa their ways how to sustain themselves and how to become the the actual force power of democracy, to watchdog what's happening, to report, to be critical, uh, to um, re-establish the investi uh, investigative journalism and so on. This is happening already. This has been happening since 2000s, since 90s in Ukraine, but nowadays uh, there is an opportunity and there is a huge need for this. So I feel like people and also what is being seen from the, from the tendencies on the ground, civil society and independent media, they do have this drive and they do have this desire to learn the skills what to do next and they need some trainings and they are very vocal about it. And here is where some international partners come in, um, again, to be responsive to what is needed on the ground. From the international perspective, I think here again, Ukrainians are in power because they are in Europe, for instance. They are in all of the other countries around the world. Um, they are able to share their personal stories. And from the human perspective, you do believe another human being standing in front of you saying that, yes, we've fled from the bombings of the houses. If this is real. If some propaganda is still working, it is the long-term perspective. But again, propaganda was also built with time. And fighting it takes time, takes an effort. Ukrainians, from my personal apparently biased perspective, are doing it very fast, but with a very high price. Okay, because I may say, and you will certainly agree, the media are playing a pivotal yes. uh, role in countering the Russian narrative, which is everywhere. And that's not only a question of uh, money, which is plugged into the system subversively. Uh, this is the result of a strategy over maybe 10, 15, 20 years when Putin came to power. So. Uh, some criticism, uh, Ukraine in many aspects until some years ago was sleeping and did not counter uh, the Russian things. Talking about culture, yeah, uh, that Russia is doing a cultural initiative uh, in order to spread the narrative, etc. So cultural ambassadors of Russia. This was not countered by Ukraine for many years. They were just silent. It's not only a question of money. And only with the Ukrainian Institute it started. Yeah? And that has been maybe five, six, seven years ago. Before, there, before that, there was nothing. Sorry, if I may add. Uh, yeah? The responsibility of receiving information also rises on the person receiving the information. I don't mean to undermine or to neglect the role of Ukraine um, as itself to be more vocal about it. Uh, but frankly speaking, um, I mean, this is also the tendency what we see uh, with, with countries fighting for democracy. Um, choosing on the plate of priorities, defense is the priority. Sheltering from rockets is the priority. And this, unfortunately, has been the history of Ukraine for not only the last century. And again, because of the neighbor. When it comes to the cultural um, 
aspect and so on. Yes, but this is also, we can look at it from the post-colonial perspective because at some point it was more, uh, um, how to say, like more fashionable to be um, a Russian imperialistic writer than actually acknowledge that you are coming from the village in, in the northern part of Ukraine just because to be able to go to places, to see places. And this, and this stucks with the history. Yeah, but just to give an example, that uh, Leonard Bernstein, mm -hmm. family of Leonard Bernstein, is from Rivne, and uh, who is this famous American composer. Um, I forgot the name, sorry. But even, even the same uh, famous as, as, as Bernstein, uh, it's Ukrainians. And this is not known. It was taken. It was taken by by, by Russia, or it was taken as American. And uh, nobody knows that these people are Ukrainian. Okay, let's continue. Maybe I may ask if you are here, Alexander, uh, Alexander Sushko, from the International Renaissance Foundation. Are you there? Yes, thank you. I'm Perfect. Here. Uh, Alexander, we were speaking in Kiev three weeks ago or something like that. So please, as I told you, uh, you are not related to government and this and that, and uh, uh, you are representing a, a very powerful and very international organization. And uh, I'm asking you to speak very openly. Uh, what are your thoughts, also partly uh, to what you heard uh, so far? Thank you so much. So, yes, our foundation is working to strengthen civil society for, for decades, for over 30 years. And we uh, really uh, have been observing the whole history of Ukrainian independent civil society. And here, uh, I really have a lot of uh, experience with various actors of Ukrainian civil society. And first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, it's very diverse. It presents a wider and wider spectrum of the interests. And uh, certainly it is difficult sometime to say, uh, to summarize what is the main goal of the civil society, probably this diversity also provides uh, certain risks, but this is the normal trend. And yes, uh, we have a moment when uh, there is a uh, hope, and we as a foundation and our partners are hoping for this, that Ukrainian civil society will not just strengthen, not just empower uh, during the war, but also to find a more advanced way of providing systematic impact on national, regional, and local levels. Uh, certainly now we have an extraordinary situation of war. And the civic activism, which was generated by the need to defend the country, is extraordinary one. So there is certainly we hope the war will end and there will be no more life again. And our interest in these circumstances is how to preserve the energy of the civil activism and how to channelize it into systemic efforts and opportunities for the active people to build better state, better society, better relationships across the country. So first of all, we have a really um, flourishing uh, horizontal links between the people, which is a, which is a fundamental for, for any civil society. So we have so many self-organized people as never before. Here I can only agree. But then how how to proceed to more advanced form of civic participation. And here I think that the major challenge, because uh, as war continues, as war um, consumes and even exhausts civic energy, there is a risk that the, after the war, 
we will have a frustration and we will have a demoralization of the part on the side of part of the people who were closely involved who invested their best resources best available energy and then the picture will uh, in the end will not be so perfect to satisfy everyone's expectations and so probably we will have a frustration which will lead to departure of many of current activists from the activism and uh, so so the question is what what to do next how to prevent the or at least minimize the risk of demobilization of of the civil society of its departure from the stage we already have seen this this phenomenon of uh, several times in our history especially during our historical moments such as orange revolution of 2004 and the revolution of dignity 2013-14 so we have seen that uh, certainly after after mobilization usually we see more uh, so frustration and even uh, so loss of energy yeah and uh, certainly something will happen this way because nobody can preserve nobody has an instrument to keep people so active as they are in the extraordinary circumstances. So in the normal life, the, uh, the activism uh, will certainly not be so massive. But what to do in order to give people real instruments of, on in, of influence, uh, even uh, without extraordinary situation? And here we are coming to the challenge which we face which we will need to address in the in the future we are thinking about it now how to build build channels of participation channels and mechanisms where ordinary people who have to deliver who has some ideas who have some uh, something to to change some uh, some issues how then can build a uh, uh, real, workable, efficient mechanisms of communication to be a part of the uh, of the real life where decisions are taken. Uh, and uh, so here, I think that there is a lack, there is a shortage of instruments on all levels. And uh, I understand that uh, certainly now, when the war is continuing. The government has no other way than to accept this kind of the activism. But then, certainly, uh, when the, the situation normalizes, there will be again a uh, 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 feeling of disconnection. And so here, I think that the civil society has to think about the common interest, how to build, maybe some legal change, uh, changes are needed of various forms, uh, starting from the normal mechanisms of public consultations and continuing with the uh, mechanisms of access to the public funds for civil society organizations through competitive, transparent and accountable policies and mechanisms. Because, yes, uh, you mentioned the role of our foundation, but private foundation cannot replace the public funds and this is a shortage of access of ukrainian civil society organizations to the public funds uh, and so the, there is a lack of certain culture so i think that thinking about future uh, we are preoccupied first of all with the idea to make this civic activism uh, sus more sustainable not to be so dependent on extraordinary situation. And then there is a big work ahead, work ahead with, with us, with our partners, with the whole civil society of Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Alexander, in my humble opinion, you have pointed out two very true 
aspects. One is uh, the necessity to find more advanced ways. And secondly, uh, the issue of frustration. This is something you find in all industry, in economy, in business. Yeah? When you have a big project which keeps you up and uh, keeps you under stress 20 hours a day for several weeks, as soon as you have accomplished what is needed, there is a kind of emptiness. And is it that what you mean, what may happen uh, at the end or after the end of the war, right? Yes, this is a psychological moment. And also, there is a, uh, I would say, more, uh, I would say, uh, just logic of the normal life. So people will come back to the normal life. And for many of them, normal life would mean disconnection from politics. Disconnection other priorities, from, other priorities. Yeah, other priorities. But then, so we understand that there will be less people engaged in the normal life. But for those who are engaged, there should be a channel. They should not fight to knock the door uh, to the government, to the local administration. There is not an issue for struggle. There is a chance to build something more uh, open, more available for people, and then people will, will not struggle for the participation, but will participate. Understood. Uh, talking about this frustration or different priorities of some parts of civil society, don't you think that uh, uh, in the light of a certain probability that political powers may change after the war? I don't want to uh, do politics now. I don't have a right. I'm a foreigner. Yeah, But uh, speaking from industrial experience, when there is a crisis manager, uh, and uh, uh, a turnaround manager, etc., which which is similar to uh, bringing a, a country through a war uh, in order to win and 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 and, and, and yeah to win. Uh, it is similar, uh, but uh, this crisis manager, turnaround manager, in most cases is not uh, at the same time uh, a top manager for uh, doing things after the crisis. You know what I mean, yeah? Mm. So for every situation, at least in the industry, uh, there are maybe different people, the best choice. So should it happen that uh, uh, changes in the state, as we have been speaking uh, when uh, uh, Emil Brix uh, uh, was uh, moderating the panel state after the war, should it happen that there are political changes, yeah? changes in the structure of government or even in political uh, changes, as I said, don't you think that this would wake up again civil society? Okay, I hope Ukraine will continue to be a normal electoral democracy, which means that when election happens, there is a chance for the citizens either to confirm the mandate of the authorities or to change and bring other people to, to the government. So nobody can tell you there is no one single rule of the democratic uh, choice of people after the war. Sometime the, uh, the, 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 there is a change of the government, sometime not. But what is important is to continue with normal democratic way of, of, uh, uh, of political competitiveness. Because now, when we are in the, this war situation, certainly the, there is no full-scale full democracy available in the sense of, for example, we cannot have elections during the martial law, during the war. And certainly many people are waiting for the opportunity and certainly there is a um, need to have normal revival of full-scale democratic institutions and processes. 
at certain point there will be certainly some new people in the government but now it's i i'm not in the position to to predict when and what exactly it happens okay thank you very much may i take you as the last one because you have a kind of a special story and i may ask bogdan Voronzov. Uh, who is uh, one of the board directors of Vilna Nazia, and not only that, uh, to uh, reflect on what you have heard and what are your ideas uh, concerning, uh, or say, speaking for Vilna Nazia. Uh, I think you have a presentation, and I do hope that the presentation is ready to be shown. Just Good evening to everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. It's, a, it's an honor for me to discuss with you this, this, this crucial topic. And uh, my colleagues told a lot about civil society, so I'll try to be very, short, very brief. You know, Ukraine is a young country, but civil society is even younger. And, uh, but it has already significant achievements. So I would like to tell you about a few cases that different NGOs from our movement have done. So if the presentation is ready, <laughs> please show. But I'll start. For example, in, in 2021, during pandemic COVID, where a lot of people lost their jobs, the price for gas was raised. And of course, a lot of people reacted in a negative way. So our movement initiated national-wide peaceful protest with clear demands to government. It was in more than 100 different cities and villages. And you know what? It has result, results. So gas delivery fee was canceled. The next one, please. And next, another example, uh, our anti-corruption NGO reacted to, to a journalist's investigation about Konstantin Kulik. He was the first prosecutor of the general office and uh, he was suspected in illegal enrichment. So our NGO uh, sent, thank you, sent, wrote and sent a lot of applies to, to the general prosecutor office and held a lot of peaceful protests, and he was fired. Another example. I'm sorry. Maybe. Maybe. Want me to help you? <laughs> another example. Another. An, uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> another anti-corruption NGO reacted to journalist investigation about Konstantin Zhivago and his financial scams. Reacted, sent a lot of appeals, and after some time it was criminal proceeding, after some time he was put on the wanted list. So there are a lot of completed cases from different NGOs. This is only a few cases, completed cases. But, the next one, please. But our mission is even bigger. Our mission is to consolidate national and local organization into one single platform, coordinating them, coordinating their actions, educating them how to influence on the government, their rights and protests. And what we have done, you can see, during two, year, two past years, we, uh, or we combined more than 480 different local organizations. <laughs> Thanks. Local organization. This organization have more than 507 branches all over, all over Ukraine. 50 foreign experts and representatives from 37 countries and so on. But you know what? Modern European Ukraine needs a special approach in achieving goals in order like, to realize different projects. Civil society combines all fields of, of people's life. So 
I, I, I would like to, to tell about a few projects, CLC, Constitutional Legal Congress, anti-corruption anti organization, which has more than 350 branches all around Ukraine. Institute of Freedom, it has different expert, it has experts in different fields. So this expert can, can write like scientific documents, but besides that, I think it's more important. They can teach and provide courses in regions. You know, mostly all courses and uh, events were held only in Kyiv. So it's, I, I do believe that in regions there are a lot of smart people and it's possible like to involve them to active civil society. And we have talked already, media platform, one of our branch, one of our organization invited us like to the presentation, it, it was a month ago in Lviv. So it's, it was created the media platform for NGOs, it's totally free. So it's every NGO or every public leader can, can come, record the video and public it. I do believe that it's the opportunity for public leaders, for NGOs, to, to highlight some very important issues in Ukraine. So civil society, I totally agree with, uh, with Alfred, that is the driving force in order to develop Ukraine, in order to develop Ukraine. And I do believe that civil society can control every grivna, every dollar that be given from the West like, like financial support. Because if to be correct, it's the taxes from simple people. So simple people should control that, that money. Thank you. So what are your, <laughs> what are your aims? What you are fighting for? What are you standing for? Just, uh, uh, you have two minutes or one minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, in, in like from Big Mount, that NGOs, from 1,480 NGOs, it's totally different organization in different fields. So as you, as you saw, each, each organization has their own achievement. But I do believe that if it would be like a significant platform, it would be like easier to influence on the authority and to, it would be easier to com communicate and it would be easier like to share experience with each other. It's like a platform. But you are fighting for liberalism, right? Yep. More liberal. Yeah. Uh, as uh, I can say, we recently held uh, two events uh, about economy. It was uh, in Kyiv. So we, in our, our, our goal is to bring together international team and to write like a road map, real changes in Ukraine. So uh, just to add, they had uh, Pavlo Klimkin on some of the events. They, you even had Daniel Yuk, famous Daniel Yuk. Uh, now you have also uh, one of the founders of Nova Poshta, which is the success story, in, in one of the success stories uh, in Ukrainian industry, in Ukrainian business, etc. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Last, not least, it is Palac. Uh, there is a project you want and uh, you have been asked to talk about. This is the Invisible University of Ukraine. So, there is a short presentation. It's, it's, yeah, it's just some visualization, but yeah. Yeah, and uh, as soon as you are ready, the floor is yours. Yeah, so, so basically I just brought for you a couple of observations on transnational agency and, and uh, responsibility of civil society on the basis of this initiative. And I think it's interesting to think about what can external stakeholders can do with internal stakeholders along the lines of what Jana was also saying, that not to create a kind of 
uh, blueprint from outside and try to enforce it on Ukrainian uh, partners, but to kind of co-create it uh, somehow together. And uh, I mean, we, we started this quite immediately after the full-scale invasion, uh, actually in late March. And it was also possible to do it because the discussion about how it would be possible to do civil society, bring civil society and non-conventional educational initiatives together was predating actually the war. And originally we were not even thinking about Ukraine. We were thinking about countries where the university system was actually hacked by autocratic regimes. So actually Ukraine was exactly a good example, which we were not taking into, into account. I come from Hungary and Hungary, Poland, Turkey, uh, Azerbaijan, Georgia, these were actually the countries we had in mind. Uh, and then when, when the war started, then we saw that we put all our energy and intellectual kind of capacity into trying to do, uh, do something for the Ukrainian dislocated uh, student population. And I have to also mention that, of course, this kind of non-conventional alternative educational initiatives are not new. Yes, I mean, if you think about flying university as a tradition, this goes back to the late 19th century, a certain Marie Curie was, by the way, uh, a product of this, uh, also Janusz Korczak in the Polish case, uh, but uh, to go a bit uh, closer uh, in time, for example, uh, Charles or Karoj Polanyi's The Great Transformation, which is one of the most formative books of 20th century social sciences, was written as part of a kind of non-conventional university initiative, actually, for workers. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I, I think it's important to think it, uh, that when we are talking about education, we shouldn't just take into account university as the only locus of education, but actually this kind of partnership of civil uh, engagement, civil initiatives and university and other types of institutions. Now, uh, of course, it also raises many uh, interesting issues about what academia can do beyond just the classroom. And, and I think it's, it's important to bear in mind, and this is of course our own experience with CU as well, is that when you have to defend uh, academic freedom, it's too late. If you don't have an embeddedness in the society, then if you are just kind of trying to defend yourself as a kind of tower of knowledge, then it's already too late. I mean, you have to kind of build up this embeddedness much, much earlier. Uh, now, what we try to do uh, actually with, with our colleagues, it's, it's a quite br big, big number of uh, professors, students and, uh, and different institutions. I mean, we are talking about something like 200 students per semester and uh, something like 200, 250 teachers, yes? So, I mean, like it's actually every single class is taught by different invited uh, uh, professors. Uh, something like half of them are Ukrainians, so half of them are non-Ukrainians. And we had uh, courses on uh, history, heritage, national or uh, cultural heritage, social transformation, migration, European integration, legal system and, and many other European integration and, and all these issues. We always have curators of the classes. So, I mean, it's not the same person is teaching everything, but we have curators of the classes and they are inviting uh, uh, different other colleagues to teach. And usually the idea is that it's never one person. And this, this was very important that it was never one person who is giving a lecture. It's always a dialogical relationship. Yes. So it's always at least one Ukrainian and one non-Ukrainian performing in front of the students, which creates a completely different cognitive environment. Yes. It always poses many questions about positionality, whose, whose perspective is what, from where can you approach a certain issue. And it creates very interesting situations for the students. They don't get the master narrative, they are not just confronted that there is the Western truth or the kind of homogeneous uh, 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 master narrative, but they are also confronting that there is no such a thing as the Ukrainian position. Yes, different Ukrainian scholars or different Ukrainian experts have very often very different uh, positions. And it's it's very, very interesting discussion usually. Now, uh, what we also try to do is not only work with Ukrainian universities. I mean, of course, some of the Ukrainian universities turned out to be very resilient. So, I mean, there's no problem to to cooperate with uh, uh, institutes in, in uh, institutions in Lviv, which are all Catholic, Catholic universities university as an example, as yeah. a perfect example, or also Kiev. Uh, but we also had some institutions which were, uh, of course, in a much worse situation. I mean, like Kharkiv or uh, or others. So we also try to keep contact with these institutions. But we also try to work with some of the non-conventional institutions, like the Urban History Center in Lviv and other institutions, where we had uh, opportunity to kind of bring their 
expertise into this kind of uh, mix to, together with Western institutions. Now, what does this tell us about uh, questions like global civil society? Yes, I mean, here the, the question was, of course, uh, not to just uh, create bilateral situations. So it was not like CU, Vienna, Budapest, and Ukraine, but CU was o operating as a kind of mediator for many other institutions as well. We have a course with Harvard, for example, Harvard professors are offering a course for students to uh, how to enter international academia, and, and we are also working with uh, Imre Kertes' colleague and University of Vienna, and they were bringing in their, their funding. So basically we created a kind of multilateral uh, cooperation. And, and the, of course this was fitting very much into the discussion that if you are interested in theory of civil society, then you could have uh, followed in the last uh, 20 years uh, what co global civil society m means and what global civil society can do, which in national civil societies cannot uh, do. Now, uh, in the early 2000s, when Mary Caldor and others were launching this uh, concept, then it was a very optimistic moment. Yes, everybody believed that global civil society is by default a kind of good thing. I mean, we are going to globalization and expansion of this transnational agency is going together. But of course, I think, again, coming from Hungary, but if you come from other uh, countries as well, you can tell this, there is also global uncivil society. Yes, I mean, like there is a lot of exchange uh, we, f we see it every day between the different institutions which are actually operating more or less like civil society, but actually kind of hacking the agenda of civil society. And when we were kind of trying to uh, uh, operate our uh, transnational networks and transnational agency, then we were also kind of operating in a framework where we are actually par permanently encountering this kind of global uncivil society. I mean, I don't want to mention too many uh, cases, but as you probably know, the Hungarian urbanist think tank bought a university in Vienna two weeks ago, yes? So I mean, like we are actually operating non not in this kind of optimistic one directional globalist logic, but in a much more complicated uh, situation. And that also means, uh, and that was very important for us to to realize that for, for students also to, to uh, contrast them or confront them with, for example, the European framework, it is not just to tell that you have a one directional eschatological direction, you have to enter Europe and then everything will be fine. When the students first came to Budapest, they all wrote in their mo motivation letter, we had the summer school in Budapest, we, they all wrote in their motivation letter that we want to come to a European Union country to see best practice. And then we in, uh, brought them together with Hungarian NGO leaders, actually the top Hungarian NGOs uh, representatives, and they were telling what's going on in Hungary about NGOs. And then you know, Ukrainian students became completely shocked, yes, because their image was that, you know, everything that, that you, if you enter European Union, all your problems will be solved. And then they were watching, 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 and at some point one of the girls from, from uh, I think Ternopil exactly, was, was listening, listening, and said, that, why don't you make a revolution? <laughs> and that was a very beautiful moment, yes, when they actually realized that it's not that they are the kind of permanent students who have to learn the best practice that is taught to them by the big European brother, but actually they have certain kind of assets in their own political culture and in, in their own political history, which they can actually teach to Europeans. Yes, I mean, it was a very beautiful moment and very sad moment if you are a Hungarian, of course. Uh, uh, and <laughs> And, and then uh, I think what, what I would like to stress here is that exactly in this uh, sense, I think when we are talking about this kind of encounter and this kind of exchange, then the point is not to kind of transmit a master narrative. It's not just to delegate the European knowledge to Ukrainian students. It's actually as much learning from or the European partners from Ukraine and Ukrainian colleagues than from uh, the European colleagues for the Ukrainian students. It's a bilateral dialogical situation. And I think in this respect, if I can be very rhetoric, but I hope you understand also the irony, but the seriousness of this. We are talking about all the time whether Ukraine is ready for Europe. But I would also ask the question the other way around, that is Europe ready for Ukraine? And I think it's... Sorry, correction. Uh, Ukraine is Europe. Well, I mean, <laughs> European yeah. institutions and in Europe. So I would, I would try to turn it upside down a little bit. Thank so, Palac, thank you very much. Uh, I can't agree more that initiatives like this are really important. And uh, I give you an example. There is uh, you are for students, Euro Central European University. Uh, 
this is already, say, the last stage of education, unless it is training on the job. Before, it's youth, children and youth. And uh, uh, youth, it is, uh, there is an organization, uh, it's called Junior Achievement. Worldwide, twice nominated for the Peace Nobel Prize, and uh, I'm working for them in Ukraine. I have the privilege to be board member of Junior Achievement uh, in Ukraine. So this is one step prior, before the university. And uh, uh, just to finish, uh, before we have maximum 10 minutes for questions and answers, uh, this is a very, very important and eminent, is eminent issue, because in Ukraine, first, there was COVID, with a lot of interruption of education. Then, even without a hiatus, even, even uh, without uh, any time in between, uh, there was coming the war. Both interrupted uh, the system, the education system. And if, since the war will not be over tomorrow, or uh, say, uh, 1st of September for the next school year, or university year, this means uh, many of the young people they have lost two, maybe even three years of education. Okay, they've lost 50%, 60%, but still it's one or two years of education which are lost. So all the more, it is so important that uh, uh, things are taken up, uh, like a Central European University, your initiative, your project, uh, Invisible University. Thank you very much. We have maximum 10 minutes, question and answer. Any questions? Please be short. Anybody with a microphone? Short question, and uh, everybody of us, short answer, maximum 10 minutes in total. Gunther Filling, my question. The question is about the European Parliament elections next year and about the Ukraine's future in the European Union, hopefully in 2029. Because sorry, sorry, this has nothing to do with this panel, <laughs> no, or has it? The question is here, <laughs> how far is the civil society uh, preparing uh, this EU accession of uh, Ukraine and how uh, is also the preparation inside the European Union for that? Because ultimately it's very important uh, that Ukraine joins the European Union, so this needs to be prepared and that's the role, I think, of the civil society to make exactly this transformation into European Ukraine. That's my, my question. Okay, anybody to answer two sentences? I'm just a moderator, so <laughs> <laughs> should be somebody of you. Although I would have some thought, but it's not my role. I, if I may, maybe it was one sentence. I think that Ukrainian civil society has been preparing this from the latest 2013. Uh, before that, it's been already there and vibrant. And since then, the reforms are taking place, and civil society is pushing for it and monitoring it and evaluating it. It could have been done better, but the process has been going on for a long time already. OK, there was another question here. Please. I would like to return to the question of frustration, which was really very important. And we felt it in 2014, when we were actively stand in Kiev to protect our democratic choice. And then uh, some people came to power. Uh, nobody knew them. And they started to tell everybody what to do. Later on, there was presidential elections, and then more or less, uh, Every, everything was stable. But this uh, moment when you are very actively involved in, uh, uh, um, in the actions, uh, political actions which are going on in the country, and then some unknown people come and how they came to the power, who are behind them, who were behind them. And uh, really we are afraid of this moment as well here now when the, we uh, hope the uh, war is over and again some unknown people come and uh, maybe some uh, un unclear um, targets and aims would start to, to tell what to do. And, uh, um, but nowadays, uh, as you, maybe you know, maybe not, uh, civil society, Ukrainians, just simple Ukrainians, they collect huge uh, amount of support to people on the front. Uh, 
At the beginning, I didn't want to support army because it's a military issues. But when I understood that uh, my um, friends, husbands, my friends, children are fighting on the front, they, they were not militaries. They were just uh, brought to military service. And sometimes they were lacking of underwear, I'm sorry. They were lacking of some medicines or some sweets because they are, they are people. And uh, it is a huge movement now in Ukraine to collect all this support to army, to people who are on the front, and to support them. Uh, in the amount of money, I don't have figures, but I feel it. And we know these people who are leaders in this movement. Uh, we, these volunteers, they know each other very well. They are very good managers and leaders, and usually they are very busy. They do not make advertisement of themselves. They do not make any political steps to be promo promoted. But they are doing a lot of good things. And it is a very good moment to unite them, to make them known, uh, and then to, to attract them to political uh, movements after the war to rule the country in fair and honest way. And uh, my question is, do we have now a political power which can unite these people, or uh, should we create this power? Thank you. Uh, <laughs> this is highly political and uh, not just civil society. I know that there are, speaking as a moderator, <laughs> as a facilitator, I know that there are some intentions by some uh, uh, civil society movements also to play a political role. But I feel, unless you are of a different opinion, this is not a topic for tonight. But maybe, since uh, we have the privilege to have Alexandra with us, Maybe you have uh, two minutes for a final statement uh, because you have been watching, you have been following uh, this panel. What are your observations and uh, uh, what are your thoughts? Maybe as a final statement. I think that the crucial role for civil society from different perspectives and challenges which we face is to keep the frame of democracy, of rule of law, and human rights. And we have to keep uh, these values as a priority in Ukrainian society. And we like provide a time for new political forces to emerge and I can refer to um, distin distinguished colleagues who just asked the question about uh, political parties that I think that this large scale invasion show us that if we want to do something and to make something happen, we have to take responsibility on their own shoulders.